All right, hello, welcome. We're New York Worcester Parks and we are thrilled to be a part of the 27th annual Bronx Parks Speak Up. We wanna start by thanking the Bronx Coalition for Parks and Green Spaces and the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality for organizing yet another fabulous conference. We're really thrilled to be a part of it today to share some of our resources with you all. My name is Emily Walker. I'm the Director of Outreach and Programs at ny for peace And hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having us. My name is Jessica Saab, and I'm the Advocacy and Communications Project Manager at New Yorkers for Parks. Um, welcome to our presentation, Bronx Parks by the Numbers. We'll be introducing some of our newest research, which will drop soon. And we'll be going, some of our, we'll be going over some of our other tools. So to begin, a little bit about New Yorkers for Parks. We are the only independent citywide organization that advocates for quality parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. Established over 100 years ago, we champion equitable development, distribution, and maintenance of open spaces across all of NYC. So we trace our origin back to 1908. And um, the way we work is through partnerships, developing advocacy and developing research. So all three of those elements are constantly in flux together. And um, we really thank our grassroots partners for being part of that, like all of those in the Bronx. So we're gonna talk first about our open space profiles. Um, we're gonna give you all a sneak preview in just a few moments of um, the newest iteration of these that are coming out. But um, this is our only citywide report that we do at New Yorkers for Parks. Um, we started making these in 2000 and we've continued making them every five years. So our most recent iteration before the newest ones that are coming out was our 2015 city council district profiles. Um, you can find the archive of those on our website. Um, we've listed the link here um, and it's in our, our research section of, of what we do at NY4P. But this is a pretty high level overview for folks throughout the city to understand the open space assets that they have in their communities. Um, but we also try to overlay that with demographic information about the city itself and the neighborhoods so that folks have a better understanding of, for instance, how many kids are maybe living in their district and whether there's a playground space for them. Um, so we're going to go now into a sneak preview of our exciting new um, version of these. So um, the forthcoming 2021 open space profiles will be going live in the next few weeks. Um, so we'll, we'll be sure to share with you how you can make sure you're in the loop for when those get released publicly, but we wanted to give you all a quick sneak preview. Um, one of the most significant changes we've made this time is that instead of being based on city council districts, um, our new open space profiles are actually going to be based on community board district wide. Uh, one of the large reasons for that is because the 2020 census will result in a complete redistricting of all of our city council district lines, which means in 2022, all 51 city council districts in the city are gonna be redrawn slightly. So we decided it made more sense to spend our efforts and energy in um, creating a resource that could be usable for a longer amount of time. Community board district boundaries tend to not change as much. Um, so this felt like a safer bet for us in terms of doing a really comprehensive look at the city. Um, and the other reason we made this shift is that the parks department itself allocates its resources based on community board districts. So there's a lot of synergy and alignment with how the city is making decisions about open space um, staffing and resource allocation. Um, and, you know, finally, I think for a lot of New Yorkers, the community board district lines can form a little bit more to, I think, the lived experiences that we all have in terms of what we do as our neighborhoods. Council districts tend to be um, a little more wonky in how they're drawn and don't necessarily uh, conform to what we feel uh, represents our actual neighborhood. So we're excited about this change. Um, and we're going to walk you through in just a second a uh, sort of sneak peek of some of the data that's coming out of that. Um, but I'll turn it over to Jessica. All right. Some of the other things that are new in this latest iteration is a focus on health. We have additional amenities and especially metrics that cover different things about health and the environment of every district, as well as additional, more um, comprehensive demographic information. And we also have them in Spanish this time around. So we're really excited. All 59 open space profiles will be available in Spanish. Los perfiles del espacio abierto 2021. So um, we'll be really excited to help distribute those. And we welcome all suggestions on what community groups might need these resources. So please feel free to reach out to us. And um, these will be available for free online, of course. So we hope that they'll go far and wide. 
So we just wanted to give a few select insights from the data that will be released soon. Um, here you can see a map that we've included that visualizes the total park acreage for 1,000 residents. Um, the Bronx is known as, as the highest park borough. <laughs> that is definitely not an elegant way of saying it, but the Bronx has the most park acreage of any of the five boroughs. However, as you can see from this map, um, the distribution of those acres is not necessarily um, equitable. So where you see the darker red on this map is the, the parts of the city and for the community districts that have a higher amount of park acreage available to residents. Um, so the lighter in color to white that you get means that there is less open space access overall for residents of those districts. Um, we wanted to call attention to some of the data that we have found um, specifically as it relates to health outcomes and some of the things that we think sort of speak to potentially the connection between open space and greenery and those public health outcomes. So as you can see, um, and I think for a lot of Bronx residents, this is sadly not going to come as a surprise, but life expectancy in the borough is well below the citywide average. Um, but that is also not concentrated equally across the borough. Uh, when you map this out, you really do see that the life expectancy rates in the, the central and south Bronx um, tend to be lower than parts of the north Bronx, but also relative to the city overall. So that's obviously, I think, an area of major concern for residents of the city, but especially residents of the Bronx. Um, the, the, the Bronx has a really significant proportion of child um, asthma incidences per, per community district, as well as child obesity rates. Um, similarly, there are high rates of obesity for adults and high outcomes for adult diabetes as well. Um, again, I think, you know, for long time public health and open space advocates in the Bronx, this is not necessarily surprising information, but what we hope is that um, the new open space profiles will help really put the open space and parks um, conversation into the public health conversation because we think there are a lot of advocacy efforts that can be drawn that really connects to open space and greening investments. Um, air pollution is something that for the borough is um, really, really high relative to the rest of the city. And again, concentrated primarily in the central and south Bronx. Um, I think for folks that live in the borough, but especially in those parts of the borough, this will come as no surprise that having this data can be a really powerful tool for trying to advocate for change. Um, finally, the tree canopy coverage is a, a new metric that we've included that I think is really interesting. Uh, Bronx Community Board 8, um, which is in the Northwest Bronx, has the, the highest tree canopy coverage in the entire city. Um, but then when you go to Bronx Community District 2, which is the Hunt Point and Longwood section of the borough, you have the second lowest canopy coverage citywide. So it's a really disparate story that's being told in the Bronx. And unsurprisingly, the rates of public health outcomes kind of correlate um, in terms of having worse public outcomes where there are less trees. So um, this is just a snapshot. There will be more data for folks to dig into when these are released, but we wanted to kind of give a high level overview of some of the things that we think might be compelling um, from a storytelling standpoint and from an advocacy standpoint. Um, so, sorry. To, <laughs> no, go for it. Like, especially in light of the recent year and COVID um, with everything happening, it seems that this focus on health is especially timely. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so one of the ways that we want to encourage folks, and I think, you know, those of you who have attended a speak up before, this is probably, I probably sound like a broken record, but, um, you know, we really want to work to rectify some of these inequities, and we really are grateful to share this um, common purpose and goal with you all as park and open space and garden advocates in the borough. Um, if you aren't already a member of our Playfair Coalition, we do encourage you to join. You can find out more about this multi-year campaign and coalition at playfair.nyc. Um, but, you know, we're working towards increased investments and resources for NYC parks. Um, and we really believe that this is a, an important moment for us collectively as a city to make sure that parks and open spaces are not left behind because for too long we've seen that investments have not kept pace with the amount of park usership. The pandemic has really just increased the amount of folks that are relying on our parks um, in so many ways that we're not seeing the investments made by the city to make sure that our parks are adequately staffed and kept clean. And that's the whole theme of this year's conference. So um, we really would encourage you all to join us in this work and we need your voices to reach City Hall and our decision makers, as well as folks that are running for office this year. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica to talk a little bit more about how you can plug into the work that we're doing. 
Thank you. So I will encourage anyone who watches this video, everybody, to please sign up for our emails in order to advocate with us. We are streamlining our communications platform. We're trying to become a digital first organization, especially now in this new virtual era for better or for worse. So we encourage you all to please go to this link, sign up for our emails and stay to in in touch and stay tuned, both of them, um, because we'll be having different events coming up, different things that we'll be asking our coalition partners and general audience to plug into in order to advocate for parks. So please stay tuned. In terms of other things available to put this data into conversation with, here are some other resources and data sources available from different partner organizations and public agencies. We have the Department of City Planning's community district profiles, which also go by the community district boundaries. Super helpful to have them in conversation with each other. Same with the Department of Health's community health profiles. Um, they also recently released an environmental justice area map, which you can check out at these links. And there's a couple of other organizations, the Pratt Center, the NYU Furman Center. Um, there's a lot of data out there, but it's good to have them in one place and be able to take a look at them, see how they compare and see how you might be able to use them for your own advocacy. Moving so we're along. Just gonna yeah, we're just going to quickly um, go over some of the other resources that New Yorkers for Parks has available to you. Um, so for some of you, this might just be a friendly reminder, but if you're new to our organization, hopefully this will be a good sort of overview of what we have that might be helpful to you as you start to advocate for your local open spaces. So first, we have our Open Space Index series. Um, this is a really deep dive that we do into specific neighborhoods. Um, we have not been able to do this report um, for every neighborhood in the city uh, at long term. That would be an amazing thing that we would hope to accomplish. But we do want to call attention to the fact that we have um, two reports that do touch the Bronx, which is our Southern Boulevard Open Space Index um, and our Mott Haven Open Sp Space Index. So if you're a resident of those neighborhoods or if you work or are active in those neighborhoods, this is a really powerful advocacy tool um, and a data set that is really rich in terms of understanding how these communities um, are being served or not served by open space and, and park amenities. Uh, we have 15 specific benchmarks that we use to look at how these communities are being um, you know, served by open space. And these are also New York City specific benchmarks that the city itself wants to be meeting. So as an advocacy tool, these are really powerful uh, reports that we encourage folks to use because the, we're we're basically holding the city to account for goals that it has set for itself and finding where it's either meeting or exceeding those expectations or what, where it's falling short. Um, so you can find those all on our website. Again, it's our Open Space Index series. Um, so moving on, I'll turn it back to Jessica. Yes, thank you. So something else that touches on the Bronx is a podcast project that we created that's all about community gardens in New York City. Um, if you live in the Bronx, you're familiar perhaps with the history of community gardens, but this four part audio series includes interviews with over 35 gardeners citywide and really explores the, the origin of gardening in New York City, the past tribulations, the current way they're being used by community members and the different options that gardens are facing in the future. So you can listen to that on any podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all of those. And you can check it out on our website. We have the transcripts up along with images and all of our sources listed. And it's really just an excellent way of listening to um, gardeners themselves speak about what compels them to create a beautiful open space out of something that was probably not there before. So moving along. Um, so I just want to highlight our How Can I Improve My Park Guide. Um, this is a resource that we're really proud of. It's available in both English and Spanish. This is a great primer for folks to learn how they can work with the city to get um, either increased resources, be that better staffing, um, or just ongoing maintenance in your park. Um, but more importantly, it's a roadmap for how you can work with the city and with your local community board and the parks department to seek capital funding to improve or overhaul um, your park. 
So it's a really complicated process, but it's a really important one because NYC Parks does not have its own discretionary capital budget. That means that New York City Parks as an agency really relies on our elected officials to make allocations of their funding um, to do things like renovate playgrounds or put in new athletic courts or park amenities. Um, and unfortunately, it means that this is a process that's often community driven. So we really try to demystify how everyday New Yorkers can play a role in making these kinds of transformative changes take place in their local parks. Um, we did this with the Center for Urban Pedagogy and our friends at Partnerships for Parks. And again, we're um, really proud of this and, and encourage folks who are interested in trying to seek um, infrastructure overhauls in their parks to seek out this guide. Awesome. Next up, we have our Public Realm Bill of Rights, which was made through years of community collaboration and highlights five key aspects for quality open space, which are access, infrastructure, health, environment, and funding. So we use this document as a baseline to advocate for better parks across all of NYC, and we encourage others to do so as well. We have it in English, in Spanish, and in simplified Chinese, and it's been kind of the, the backbone to all of the work we do. So many of you may um, know the New Yorkers for Parks best, or maybe you've been introduced to our organization through the Daffodil Project. This is our signature public program that we started in 2001. Um, it's a living memorial to 9-11 and it is a partnership that we do with NYC Parks officially and we distribute free daffodil bulbs each fall to any New Yorker who's willing to plant them in a public space. So it's a great way for New Yorkers for Parks to support um, community stewardship groups and folks that are interested in beautifying their neighborhoods. And it's just a really beautiful program and a, a great way for you to um, join together with your neighbors. Daffodil bulbs are incredibly easy to plant no matter what age you are. So we found that it's a great entry point for civic and um, neighborhood beautification. And you can learn more about this program on our website. And I, we also encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletter because that is how we announce bulb registration each summer. Um, this fall will be the 20th anniversary of this amazing program. And we hope that you can each participate by getting bulbs to plant in your local park, garden, playground, um, street tree bed. Um, so you can learn more at our website. And um, you can just see a quick map here that shows our 2019 planting locations. And it really gives you a sense of just how um, how far the reach of this program is. And we would love to see a dot in every neighborhood and in every park. So um, find out more and join us this fall. Um, the final resource that we will share with you is um, two just sort of quick primers. One is our clean and green guide that's available on our website in English, Spanish, and simplified Chinese. It's a great primer on who takes care of our parks, who are the different staff uh, folks that are doing the really essential work to keep our parks clean and safe. Um, if you're new to you know, park stewardship or advocacy, it can actually be kind of challenging to figure out exactly who the different staff people that you interact with in NYC parks are. And this is a great way of kind of learning how the agency structures itself. Um, and then finally, I'll just call quick attention to our Improve Your Park Guide. This is a great kind of cheat sheet of all of the different resources that New Yorkers for Parks has pulled together for advocates and park stewards. Um, it also gives a great high level snapshot of kind of the year in action for advocates so you can understand at what point in the year you may want to do things like engage with your local community board or, um, you know, get the resources you need to do park cleanup days. Um, the other side of this document, it's a two page PDF, um, lists resources from some of our peer organizations that we think is also really useful for park advocates to um, have at their fingertips. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica. Thank you all so much for your attention. I think if, um, if we'd all been in person, we would have had printed copies to distribute, but we do hope that you'll go online, you'll go to our website and find these resources and use them as much as you need to. We encourage you to reach out to us, um, follow us on social media. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your conference and please be in touch. Bye. Bye.